Hello, friends, and welcome to the Reclamation Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Colleen Johnson, and I'm here to guide us in raw conversations about thriving in life and work so that together we can step into personal agency and stop letting life happen to us. We'll cover topics like health, boundaries, communication, finances, and worthiness. That badass business you've been dreaming of, it's not so far off. The desire to wake up feeling fully alive, it's right around the corner. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I am really pumped for today's episode. It's going to be so fun and juicy and so good. But before I get ahead of myself, I'm recording from my office. It's a delightful rainy day. It started out this morning pretty sunny and then now it's transitioned to a rainy day. So it's just nice. Like you may hear the rain outside and it's just kind of very vibey in here. My dog is in his normal place sitting down on the floor and I've got some incense burning. So there's just like, again, that very vibey feel. So that's kind of where I'm recording from. And who I have here in front of me and who I have with me here is Zahar Martinez, a licensed marriage and family therapist, professor of diversity, podcast host, and mama of two wild boys. So for the last decade, Sahar has been supporting women and couples as they transition into their unique journey into parenthood. Sahar's clinical focus includes perinatal mental health, working with diverse populations, and attachment-focused trauma-informed therapy. Sahar is deeply passionate about guiding women in their reclamation of self, in addition to the endless roles they often take on as partners, mothers, sisters, and friends. Sahar, I'm so excited to have you. I'm so excited to be here. I like, it's very odd sitting on the other end hearing someone talk about you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, totally. I believe it. (laughs) For everybody listening, Sahar and I have been in a mastermind together for the past nine months. So it's really fun because most of the time we've been in kind of a a very different container. And this is just really fun because I get to actually hear a little bit more about Sahar and her work and her story. And it'll be so fun. So And it's like, we come from like the most intimate of spaces that we share in our corner of Zoom. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah, I love it. So before we dive in, I would love if you could share kind of where you're recording from, what you have in front of you, set the stage, fill us in on the, the sensory experience that you have around you. So I'm in my bedroom. I'm sitting on my bed on linen sheets that feel very cozy. I'm in Southern California, so it's sunny outside. Hmm. Um, I'm beneath a weighted blanket, which feels nice. Yes. And it's very bright and light in here and a little bit noisy because my kids are downstairs and they're echoing up here. (laughs) I love it. I love it so much. I love that you pointed out like the linen sheets as well. I recently bought a velvet chair for my office and I haven't mentioned that like on the podcast when I'm, I usually just look a little bit more external, but I love that the piece of things, the texture. So good. Mm Mm-hmm. It feels nice. It's like a nice way to ground into things. Yeah, definitely. Especially when like for everyone listening, like wherever you're at, you can kind of start to picture where we're at and like gives us a chance to ground you a chance to ground. Everybody's, everybody's a little more grounded. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So I would love if you could fill us in a little bit on what's your story. How did you start? Because I know you've got so much that you're doing currently, but I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of like what that your own journey was like. Sure. Professionally, I've been doing this work for a decade, like doing therapy. And I started out as a graphic designer. So I started out in that space, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, working in fashion and entertainment. So I did that for, I started doing that at 18 and did that for around a decade um, before I went back to school to be a therapist. So that is like a large part of my story and things that I had to reclaim in order to fulfill like what was what I feel is my life's work is starting over essentially at 28 and saying, I don't find passion in what I'm doing. And what I really want to be doing is this thing that I now have to invest all this time and money Mm -hmm. and life into for the next couple of years in order to be able to do it. So I did it. Um, I'm still doing it and it feels really great. I think the largest piece of that was having to step forward into what I wanted and not 
not taking on the things that I thought other people were going to think. Mm. Like, did, were people going to think that I failed at my career because I was making this career change at 28, yeah. 27? Were people going to think that I wouldn't be able to do it because I was, you know, in my late 20s starting over? Mm-hmm. And so I had to release a lot of those negative narratives. And I remember like my first day, like at grad school, I was like, oh my God, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Like, this is my, these are my people. This is my space. This is exactly where I want to be. So it was in remaining connected to that when like those negative thoughts would come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. So I'm feeling very inspired by this already because I'm turning 28 in a couple months. I feel like, I feel like I just have to share a little bit of my story because this is really, I don't know like it's just meant to be. Um, but it's interesting because so I actually started pivoting. So I've been a graphic designer, photographer and in marketing since I was oh like, yeah, yeah. So this is, it's just funny that like, I love this. So I started in photography as a teenager shooting wedding photography and then transitioned, went to school for graphic design, worked in graphic design and marketing. And a few years ago, I, I started a, a marketing agency with a business partner that went really badly. (laughs) And essentially it was a a failure of sorts, but that's really when I noticed a lot of my codependent patterns and all that juicy stuff that you've heard about previously, Mm -hmm. some of anyways. Um, So that's when I pivoted to life coaching, but that's really only been a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm still in that process of learning about this new field, about learning how to hold space for people, about learning to be comfortable with changing a career, even when other people around me are like, wait a second, aren't you, aren't you like the graphic designer chick, like forever? Like you've always been that, like, (laughs) so I really, that's really inspiring to hear. And um, I know that we have a lot of artists and creative people listening. And I'm curious, like what specifically during that time of transition, if you're willing to just kind of share what that looked like for you and some of the, maybe that if you had any tools or strategies that, that supported you through that time period. Cause I think a lot of folks, that's a, it's a pivotal time, you know, Saturn's return, all of that stuff. It's a pivotal time in your life when you suddenly decide, oh, I'm going to choose me now mm-hmm. and I'm not going to just play the role that I've always played? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, (laughs) And I love that this shift is like happening for you or has been happening for you in recent years because it is, it's such a powerful time in your life. I was in a a string of really toxic work environments that culminated with the last like full-time job I had working in a creative space. I ended up freelancing for many years after Mm -hmm. and like still will occasionally for friends if they need like projects or whatever, but I was in this really toxic work environment and it was starting to trickle down into my personal life. So I was like not taking care of myself the way that I wanted to. I was just feeling increasingly unhappy. And I remember like it all came to a head. I received this email from my boss at the time who like just sent me this email and CC'd the whole, like my whole team on it and listed out all these things that like I was doing wrong and not one thing on the list was my responsibility of things that I should be doing. It was other people's responsibility that were now falling on me. And I remember sitting in my apartment and getting this email and just hysterically crying from overwhelm Hmm. and something in there clicked. And I just shot an email back to uh, just replied all. And I was like, thank you so much. This doesn't seem like it's working out for you. So like I'm out. Like this is my, this is my two weeks notice. And they responded back and was like, this can be like, like, we're just done. I was like, okay, great. I had never been like, I'd never quit a job like that before. I had never been fired from a job and I drove to the office and I grabbed all my stuff and I left. Wow. (laughs) I remember going back home and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Like what happens now? Yeah. And so as like a placeholder, I went and I worked for my dad for a little while. And that was always a transitional job for me. It was still working in marketing. Like I was doing marketing for his company, but that was always a transitional job for me. Like that was never going to be where I landed. And while I was there, it gave me the opportunity to like sit and think about what I really wanted to do. And I reconnected like with my childhood dream, which was 
being a therapist, figuring out what it was that I actually wanted and then how to execute it. It came with having to admit that I wasn't happy with where I was. Mm. And so that's a good, that was a hard thing for me to do. Right. Because I had to admit in a sense, that like I hadn't failed at my job, but I had failed myself in the sense that I was not choosing me. Like I was not choosing what made me happy every day. I was choosing what I thought I was supposed to be doing. And so I had to like have that really honest moment with myself to say like, you're not happy and it's showing in every part of your life. And so what, like, I don't know if, can I swear here or? Yeah. (laughs) Like, what the fuck are you going to do about it? You know what I mean? Like, are you going to keep doing the thing that makes you miserable or are you going to make a change? And that was a scary change. Like I moved cities, like I left LA, like I'd been living there for a few years and, you know, it was, there was a lot of transition that happened in that time. And then to go into a job like that I knew wasn't going to be permanent also felt very unstable, but it was the means to getting to my purpose. Mm -hmm. And so on one hand, it was like, I, I had to trust myself and I had to show up for myself. And on the other hand, I also had to trust the process. And so those were like two very new, really hard things for me that I think were what led me to where I am today. I don't know if that answered your question or not. (laughs) Yeah, no, that totally answered the question. And it's really just, I feel like bringing some of those stories out into the open can be so therapeutic in itself to recognize that we're not alone when we're going through these huge transitional processes, when we have to face crazy work experiences that were very hurtful. Like that is a, that's bullshit to call someone out in an email that's sent to the, you know, everybody. But when we can talk about them, I feel like it's just, there's a lot of relief that can come from that and be like, okay, there's also light on the end of the tunnel when I can choose myself and kind of come home to my dreams and my vision for my life. There's so much that's on the other side of that. And so kind of with that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your current work. Like, what do you do now? How do you support folks? Um, I know that you, you love your work. So I just love to hear kind of like what has, where you've come since then. Yeah. Um, so I'm a therapist. I work predominantly with women and couples it doesn't feel like work. Like, and I think that's like the thing that I always heard from people was like, when you find something you really love to do, it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like work. Like I really love my job. So I I am a therapist. I I support individuals and couples as they are moving through the transitions of life, as they are predominantly with women who are like looking to identify or reclaim like their sense of self because we take on a lot of roles. Like we take on so many roles, whether you are a parent or you're not a parent, you're a professional or not a professional. It's, it becomes, it's very easy to disconnect from yourself. And so a lot of the work I do is around that. I teach at a local university. I teach diversity and social justice is something that's a really big, really big passion of mine. So I get to do that with students um, every day. And that feels great. It feels really, really good. And the other piece of it is that like, I, so when I left graphic design, I was like, never doing this work again. Like (laughs) I'm done. And then I would probably say like a couple years ago, I started to feel less fulfilled in my work, like as a clinician. Mm. And I realized that like, I needed to bring that creativity back into my life somehow. And I think that's the piece of like, when these transitions happen, when these shifts happen in our lives, like we don't have to fully put something away forever. And sometimes we have to take some time away from it and then reintegrate like what we need and what we want to f- like fully fulfill ourselves. Yeah. So that's where my podcast was born was like in a, in a desire and in a need to explore creativity, like through the lens of my current lived experience. So, yeah, I mean, I have my hand in a few pots, but it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're currently, you're in the process of getting your PhD, correct? Yeah. PsyD. So a doctorate in psychology. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I am doing that too. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm writing the last two chapters of my dissertation. It will hopefully be done at the end of April. Um, That's awesome. and so that like ties in, that ties in everything actually. So it, my dissertation, I, my research is on perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, so like postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, that kind of stuff in Mm. women of color. So it like ties in my passion for social justice, 
my, like the way I like to connect with people in my work. And it, it is pretty cool to like take part of my own lived experience, having experienced postpartum depression as a woman of color, and then hear other people's story and like provide a voice and a platform to f- hopefully further the profession and just societal stigma around it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I know I've seen you post like little bits and pieces on social media as you're kind of gathering stories and such. So that's cool to hear a little bit more about that. I'm curious, are you open to sharing a little bit more about how you see kind of reclaiming of self and diversity, like how those overlap and like what that looks like? Are you willing to share about that? Yeah. When I think back on like my last experience working as a graphic designer, I was in an environment that was predominantly white and I was like mm-hmm. the only person of color working there. And the way that I was treated, and then there was one other person who came in after, like while I was like, towards the end of my time there who was also a person of color. But the way that we were both treated and talked about was not how anyone else was treated and talked about. And mm-hmm. neither of us said anything to anybody other than each other. And so I think that there is, in reclaiming yourself, there is also like a for me at least, I won't speak for anybody else. For me, there was a grieving process and the things that I wish I had done differently when I was younger and I was less empowered in my own voice or I I didn't know that I had permission to say something in defense of myself. And so I think that in that reclamation of self as a person of color, when you're attending to diversity, there is this process of figuring out like how you occupy the spaces that you occupy and -hmm. realizing that there there are things that are readily available to you and there are things that are harder to obtain because of the way that you move through the world I experienced this in my experience and I'm Middle Eastern so like my parents are from Iran I identify as a person of color my experience is very different than someone who is Black or African American or someone who is Asian or Pacific Islander and Like I sit in a classroom with students who are like half of my students are white and we have these conversations about how people of color move through the world, like, and how that looks very different for a white person. And these are new conversations to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that reclamation of self for like, when you're talking about diversity is twofold, like it's in what the experience is like for people of color, but it's also in like what the experience is like for white and white white passing folks, you know, and how we can all create spaces that are more inclusive um, and how we can empower people to say like your voice matters and you can speak up about something. Mm. The way that I was treated at my last job, like the white people at that place were not treated in that way. Yeah. Like they just weren't Um, because if they had been, they would have said something Mm -hmm. and they did say things like in times when they were treated poorly, they did say things. I just didn't know that I could because I was 20 years old you know, and I didn't know any better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that shouldn't necessarily be expected of you at 20 years old. That's like the whole thing is there's other folks there that were older than you that were your bosses that should know better. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for speaking to that a little bit. And is there anything else there that you feel like is important to listeners, both people of color who are listening and for white folks? You know, like the thing that I, the thing that I always go back to when talking about diversity is like, there is such an importance in remaining curious. Mm. And so like curiosity is the answer to so many things. And in the sense of like, just ask questions and don't assume. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that like, if we all move to a place where we had genuine curiosity about one another Mm -hmm. and open, held that space open in a way that felt safe, which Mm -hmm. I think is like the other piece of it, like it has to feel safe. We would learn a lot from one another and we would learn a lot about how to move forward in ways that are more collaborative Mm -hmm. and safer and honoring and more united. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what happens is that we assume things about people based on the color of their skin, the way that they present, based on their religion, based on whatever, whatever their factors of diversity are, instead of just asking like, what is this like for you? What is it like for you to, you know, to be whatever? What is your culture like? What is Mm -hmm. your, 
What is your family like? My family is not a traditional Middle Eastern family. And I've like shared about my family with you, like in, in our group, yeah. but like, they're not traditional. So the way that you might, what the assumptions that someone might have around what it is like to be a part of a family from Iran, like is not at all what my family looks like, but you wouldn't know that unless you asked. Mm, yeah. And I feel like, and you let me know if this resonates. What I've noticed alongside curiosity is the importance of, of trusting, of trusting one another's story of like trusting as you're asking questions of people and seeking to cultivate spaces where they can share is then trusting it. Cause I think that that's where we see so much in our culture. There's so much gaslighting and so much manipulation and so much of that, you know, even if people might ask a question and then suddenly it's used against them instead of creating that safe space instead of being like, yeah, I trust you. And I trust that's your experience. How, how can I support you? How can I, you know, like, you know, at, continuing to ask those questions, but not creating that space of distrust. And I think like that you touch on something that's really, really important. So like that holding of a space of trust is I'm trying to think of like the right way to say this. I'm just going to say it. Like that's the responsibility of white people. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> um, because people of color don't have to trust white people because it oh, hasn't yeah. been yeah. a long time, you know? Totally. And so like when, when the conversation around trust comes up, I love how you said, like, how can I support you? You know, sometimes mm-hmm. it's not about the question. It's just about like, how can I, how can I be an ally to your community? Yeah. Yeah. You know, how, what is it, what is it that would be helpful right now? And so I think that's a big piece of it too. It's like trust has to be built. It doesn't yes, just come yeah. with like the existence of curiosity. Curiosity is great. And it's a great way for us to learn about one another. But that trust piece of it, like it has to be established in some way. And totally. so part of that is in the acknowledgement of the things that have happened in the world, mm-hmm. right? And how that has impacted marginalized communities. And the other part of it is saying, okay, so how can I help to make this better as we move forward? Not mm-hmm. to erase what's happened, but to make things better as I move forward. Like that creates trust because yeah. that's like, okay, then you, you are recognizing what has happened and how mm-hmm. hard that's been. Yeah. And that like, that becomes communal reclamation, right? Mm-hmm. Because now we are all like, we are all on the same page in the sense of like, we are seeing what injustices have been done and we are acknowledging them and we are recognizing that some kind of change has to happen moving forward. Hey, hey, it's Megan here. We'll get right back into today's conversation. But before we do, I'm here to let you know just a little bit about my life coaching and creative consulting. As a coach, I work with creatives, misfits, and holy outsiders who often feel trapped in overwhelm, overgiving, and fear, but who also have a passion for doing something meaningful in the world. These folks are ready to hand back their past programming and rise as the leader of their own life. If this sounds like you, and you are so ready to start your own reclamation journey, let's chat. I invite you to book a free consultation with me at my website, megscolleen.com. That's M-E-G-S-C-O-L-L-E-E-N.com. Now let's dive back into today's conversation. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I love that. That was like, I also just love that, just that, that wording, communal reclamation and the responsibility that specifically white folks have in in cultivating that and the way that I've thought about it is I feel like there's there's kind of like phases to it typically where you know self-reclamation kind of happens where you you start to learn more about yourself you you know kind of reclaim who you are and that gives you capacity to then take part in the communal reclamation and I think that's why reclamation to me is so important and so like, it, it's just such a powerful thing to think about if we can actually take back our power and if we can support others in being able to have power again, where their power has been taken away, like that's so beautiful and so um, crucial for the world that a lot of us desire to help push forth, you know, creating that better world for everyone and the safer world for everyone. Yeah. 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 So good. Ah, well, thank you for that. So for people who are reclaiming 
what empowering tips or recommendations do you have for people that are kind of in the midst of this journey, whether they're maybe, maybe it's, that's a two, two prong question. So for people who are self-reclaiming, do you have any tips or recommendations? And then for folks who are kind of more on that level of they're starting to participate in that communal reclamation, the, the collective reclamation, do you have any thoughts for them? Yeah, I think the the reclamation of self, I feel like there is like such a connection in the body when we're doing that. And so I think a lot of it is checking in with like how you're physically showing up. I know like at the time when I was going through big transition, like around work, yeah. it was showing up physically for me in so many ways that had I actually paid attention, I would have known months earlier that I had to get out of the situation. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like And so I think that part of it is in that check-in with the physical body and to notice like where you're holding and where you're feeling things and what release would look like around that. Because Mm. oftentimes with the release of that, we, we invite in reclamation of self, right? I'm releasing this negativity that's taking up space because then it gives me, like you said, capacity to take on the things that are mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, The communal piece of it, like that's all that's like the juicy good stuff, right? Like that's where we get to connect with one another and say like, this is what I can offer. Mm. Is, how can how can this help? I have this to offer. Is there a space for me to offer this? Yeah. You know, and if there is, what, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. And so that's, I think that's for, everyone can do that. Like if you are in a position of privilege or if you hold power, you have infinite things to offer, right? Can I offer my voice? Can I offer Mm. my platform? Can I offer, can I, maybe your offering is I'm going to have this conversation with someone in my community and my family, someone I'm in relationship with who maybe doesn't see things in the way that you and I see them. So my Mm. offering is that I'm going to extend this conversation out to someone in hopes that we can bring them into this. Yeah. 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 I love that. Those are really beautiful, beautiful tips. I love that. The other piece that I didn't really circle back to that I had forgotten about and I wanted to circle back to is I know you mentioned, so currently your work with your doctorate of psychology, you're um, gathering information around postpartum and pieces like that. And I wanted to see if you feel open to, to sharing a little bit more about that. So I have zero experience, zero like I don't, I don't know much about postpartum and what that looks like and that experience. And I'm curious for any mothers out there who maybe are feeling that, especially in the year that we've been in, Mm -hmm. I know that for a lot of moms, it's just been really chaotic, really crazy, whether it's postpartum or not, Mm -hmm. it's a little crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Just anything around that, that feels important or yeah. Yeah. I mean, The experience of postpartum depression is like, there is a definite connection between the lived experience each person has, Mm -hmm. like regarding symptoms and like things that you have. And it's completely unique. Like the way that you, the way that I've heard it described by the people that I've interviewed for my dissertation, like each of them have their own way of describing it. I have my own way of describing it. Like for me, it was like, I was, I knew that I wasn't myself but I didn't know why I wasn't myself. Mm. And I was someone who went into having kids informed about mental health. Like I was a therapist at the time. I was working with this population. And when it happened to me, I had no idea that it was happening. The last year, like COVID and quarantine and shelter in place has felt a lot like those first months of motherhood Mm. when you're at home with a newborn. And I know it's brought up a lot for me personally, and it has definitely brought up stuff for my clients, like being in a position of, oh my gosh, I am like in that space again, where I can't leave the house because I have something keeping me at home and I have a feeling of a loss of control. And that feels really, really triggering. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know what to do. Like, how do we work through this? And so 
there there's a lot there right like there's a lot there around processing like those feelings of grief and anxiety that come up because you're reconnected to a past experience Mm -hmm. in the same way that I think like for a lot of people who experience postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety who have also had mental health challenges prior to having kids like there is connection to that I mean like I have felt these feelings before in this way and now Mm -hmm. they're happening here does that mean that they're never going to go away so yeah, I mean, therapy, therapy helps, <laughs> yeah. but also community, like community is a big, big help. Ugh, in that. Yeah. And community in the last year has had to look a lot different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that the, the, the thing that becomes the most, the most commonly heard thing is like, I feel really isolated around postpartum depression, post- like perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is this feeling of isolation. Like I'm completely alone. No one's ever experienced this and it's only me. And I am, I am bad. I hold guilt. I hold shame because I am not mm-hmm. enjoying motherhood or my baby the way that I'm supposed to be. And so when you have community of people who have had a shared experience maybe not the mental health aspect of it, but like they know what it's like to be in the shit, like with a six week old, be you're so tired, you can't see straight, you haven't showered in a week, they can commiserate with you. And just hearing someone else say like, oh yeah, my kid didn't sleep last night either. And like my boobs are leaking and I'm exhausted and I haven't slept makes you feel less alone, Hmm. you know? And so in a, you know, community, like, I think we've all seen the value of community in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. saves you. Like it's, it's a savior in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And kind of some of what you were, you were sharing also just brought to mind the fact that we live in a society that really doesn't talk about like postpartum. It doesn't talk about that experience yeah. of motherhood in general. Like as someone who hasn't had children, there's so much about having a baby that I still don't know because it's not talked about Mm -hmm. and you hear new things and it's like, what? Like, why do we not speak about this? Why is this such a, you know, behind closed doors thing? Because it's how humans come into the world. Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) that's how every one of us had to come into the world this way. How do we not talk about it more? How do we not have better support for this again, Mm -hmm. because it's literally how humans are brought into the world. It's, it's how each of us start our first days on the planet and there's someone caretaking us and and making sure that we stay alive. Yeah. There has to be a marriage between like the way that we have seen different cultures care about women after or just birthing people, like the Mm -hmm. way that that care has happened while also integrating the conversation around mental health. Like, so it can't mm-hmm. just be physical care. It has to be like, it has to be a marriage of the both of those things, mm-hmm. like caring for the birthing person physically and also checking in just to be like, how are you doing? Like, that is the thing that I've heard the most in the research that I've done is no one after the baby was born, no one asked me how I was doing. Mm-hmm. No one was just like, I, I heard it over and over again in the interviews that I did. If someone had just looked at me, like really looked at me and said, are you okay? Okay it would have changed everything. Hmm. And I remember feeling really similarly. Like I remember saying to people like, I don't feel okay. And it would just be like, you have two kids under two. Of course you're tired. Of co-. It was like the normalization of it when I just needed someone to look at me and be like, are you okay? And if you're yeah. not okay, that's okay if you're not okay. But like, mm-hmm. how can we help? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's wild. Like that's uh, like, just hearing that is really interesting that that's the one of the key things that you've, you've pulled from that too, like the fact that it's such a simple question to ask and that it hasn't been asked is just wild and a challenge. It's like a a good, good challenge to take away. (laughs) Oh, awesome. Well, is there anything else around reclamation and reclaiming of self that you feel is on your heart to, to share or speak about whether that's your own journey or what you've witnessed before we move into wrap up questions. Yeah. I think the last thing is that it's an ongoing journey. Like it is not, you know, it doesn't just, you don't just like do it one day and then it's done. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Like I have myself has had many different lives Mm -hmm. Um, who I was at 16 is different than who I was at 26 and is different than who I was at 36 and will be different 
you know, who I am at 46, 56 and onward. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's in the, like, in the knowing of that, that like, I am who I am today and I'm proud of who I am today. And maybe there are things that I want to change and there are opportunities to do that as I just have to remain connected to the self that I am presently in. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's, that seems just like a really crucial part, even as I just think about like where I'm at right now is it's this beauty of being, first of all, I do feel just genuinely inspired. And I'm so glad that we've had this conversation today because it is really beautiful to notice like the different phases that you've gone through to be where you are today. And also for me to, to be inspired and to be challenged, to continue growing and also just to be present with who I am today and be really proud of who I am today. Cause I have gone through so many other variations of myself. I love that. That's beautiful. I think it's really easy to be like too future focused or too like connected to the past. And part of it's like, I need to honor what, like where I've come from and that's important to do, but I also need to be grounded enough in the present to like appreciate what's around me. Yeah. 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 Like the beautiful rainy day or the beautiful sunny day and the velvet and the linen. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that's so good. I feel like that was such a beautiful, like bow to the awesome. that part of the conversation yeah <laughs> awesome so then what is one way you slow down amidst our busy world naps naps Oof. I love a nap I love like a delicious daytime nap in a sunny room yes under a weighted blanket I love it so good uh also just side note I don't know if it's because we're in similar circles now or if you've used delicious as a word regularly, but my husband has made the comment to me. He's like, you use the word delicious to describe a lot of things now. And I don't know like where that came from. Uh, So I just had to point that out. I don't know if it's because we're in like some of these different spaces where those are like luscious, ease, delicious, you know, those different words, but had to point it out. Delicious has been one of my, I started, I think I started using it when I had kids, to be honest, because I couldn't think of like any other word to describe them Mm. other than just delicious. Like I love that. Yeah of human uh it's such a good word and they're like it is yeah it's a a much more descriptive word than than many others I love it and then who are a couple of your current role models I mean not to sound like cheesy but all of you guys in Madison like in our group Mm. are I mean like everything and I think that like it speaks to the value of finding good community yeah. Is that like a role model, a role model to me, like, isn't looking at people who have things that I don't have that I want. Right. Mm. It's about like finding people who live in a way that I admire mm. and who are committed to living in a way that I admire. Like that to me is the ultimate, right? Like how yeah. do I live just authentically and how do I live free of like just the bullshit, you know, that mm-hmm. comes in so easily so like I have like people, I mean, I look up to my parents and I look up to like people, sure. But like role model to me is like, I want to, I want that. Like I want mm. that like deliciousness of life they have, right? Like yeah. that, I see that like in our group. And so that's, that's going to be my answer. I love that. I, I feel like just like thinking about the essence of our group too, there is just so much to be inspired by. Like there's just such a delicious curiosity and openness and exploration. And it feels kind of infinite in a way, you know, like there's a lot of infinite energy that I feel like comes from our group, which is really beautiful. So there's something really amazing about knowing that there is a space where you are able to be witnessed completely as you are. Hmm. Yeah. You know, there, that like, that is really powerful. Mm. Um, I want to like, I want to be able to recreate that for other people, but yeah. also like not have anyone else in our bubble <laughs> because it's like our bubble, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I want other people to have opportunities to have something similar to that. Yeah. 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 And so for folks listening, like, find those people, seek out those spaces that really, the way that we're talking. (laughs) Yeah. Shout out to Madison Morgan. (laughs) Um, Find those people that you speak about in the way that we are speaking about this group that we're part of. And 
I feel like it's also important to recognize we've been together in this group for nine months. We didn't yeah. start out right. the way we feel now. It was cultivated over time. Yeah. And so finding those people you have aligned values with that you have, you know, that depth of if it's curiosity for you or just the values, like those aligned values and, and those, those spaces can be so incredibly life-giving. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important, like you make the decision. I feel like we've all made the decision to show up exactly as who we are and mm-hmm. to not be afraid to ask for what we need and to take up space. Yep. And that like, for me, like that, a lot of my work has been around like being unapologetic about taking up space. Yep. And so I think that's the other piece of it is that like to find community with people who hold you accountable to like release the bullshit, hmm. but also like, let you be like, let you be who you are. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yes. So good. And then how can we find and support you online? Because of course, everybody is going to want to come and check you out now because I mean, I just want to dive deeper into your work now. <laughs> well, you know where to find me so we can do that. I do. <laughs> Uh, I'm on Instagram at Sahar Martinez MFT. I'm on Clubhouse at Sahar Martinez or my website, sahartinez.com. Awesome. And those links will be in the show notes as well. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This has been such a beautiful conversation and I'm just honored to share this space with you and just to be, to be in your world. Thanks for having me, friend. This was so fun. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Reclamation Podcast. I hope it served you on your own reclamation journey and know that I am rooting for you all the way. If you are desiring support on your journey, head to megscolleen.com. That's M-E-G-S-C-O-L-L-E-E-N.com to learn more about me and my current coaching offerings and availability. If you want to learn more about the show guests, head to the show website, thereclamationpodcast.com. And last, but definitely not least, if you found value in the show, sharing this episode with friends and posting a quick review is always appreciated. As always, reclamation is yours. <laughs>